Okay, I should be streaming again. And I don't know if it's going to kick me into the same place on YouTube or not. I haven't done this part before, so we'll try. I'm here again. I see myself. That's a good sign. And now I just need to see if I can get somebody to call me. Here for participants. Okay, good. So maybe that's better. I mean, at least I didn't start out with the wrong audio settings. So there's that improvement, this iteration. Okay, now I've got someone calling in and what I need to do is I got to pin my own video so you're not looking at that. Okay, so is this Josh? Yep. Okay, now I can hear Much you better. nicely. Oh my gosh, this is beautiful. Hmm. So it was just a reboot that I needed maybe. Sounds like it. Okay, so hide non-video participants. Okay, I'm going to try to hide. And I guess what it wants to do is it wants to go back and forth between you and me when you're talking. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just put hide non-video participants, and that should make it so people have to look at my face the whole time as opposed to look at some black screen with part of a phone number on it. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, I don't yeah, it seems, it seems like it's going to go ahead and, and stick that way. So how are you, Josh? You're doing an awesome job. How's it going? <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I, I'm trying. It's, it's, uh, I don't feel like I'm doing an awesome job, but I feel like I'm doing something. Well, okay. So the, the, I mean, first <laughs> of all, you did something notable that showed up in New York Times, which was very creative. And I'm going to go ahead and tell the audience people hadn't heard about it. So... Really, we should stop all this spring forward daylight savings time stuff. And um, as I understand it, what you have proposed is that you're going to stay in daylight savings time throughout the year. So this would be the last time that you switched. And is that right? So, no. Um, no? So the my proposal is um to, to, jo to join the essentially time do zone, right? yeah yes to do d atlantic time zone get off of daylight savings time which is essentially doing daylight savings time but not um doing daylight savings time all year round without requiring um requiring congress to allow that and but my bill is contingent on other states also right. signing on to it and so, um, if so, Ma Maine and Massachusetts would also be required to uh, pass their legislation. If both of them passed, then yes, it would be the if if both Maine and Massachusetts uh, and New Hampshire's legislation passed this time. Um, it's possible that we wouldn't we we would just not fall back in the fall. Okay. Anymore. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Um, it would be nice if you wouldn't. So, what are the prospects for that happening? Um. <laughs> so it it was over well. Um, for Maine and Massachusetts, all all or just New Hampshire, because I think it's a big big enough hurdle just to get New Hampshire on board. Okay, so any um, of the, them, yeah. So how is New Hampshire going? So New Hampshire passed the House um, overwhelmingly, like 208 to 120 or something like that. And uh, give or take none, because <laughs> that's the actual number. And um, it, so it going to the Senate, though, there is um, a steep hurdle to climb. Um, 
why? I mean, like why, why does somebody want to go through this torture of the switching the clocks back and forth? And, and, and I, you know, of... I remember you put a detailed argument as to why it was best to stay in the one way in terms of, you know, the amount of light that it would give everybody during the day, you know, the working days. And stuff, so right? there's, there's a number of reasons why, yes, that, that making the switch is for the best. Um, a lot of, uh, some people, the pushback on the house was based on, um, the fear that kids would be going to the school in the dark, but, um, there's already a plan for that, which is to allow the kids to start school later. Okay. The, um, American Pediatric Society or whatever uh, says that we really shouldn't be starting schools before 830. Yeah. Um, you know, can, then, I can I tell you a funny story in the middle yeah. of that? I'm so sorry hmm. about like starting sure. later. No so worries. I taught at the Air Force Academy for a few years. And when I first arrived, before I ever was teaching or anything, they make you go through faculty orientation sessions, right? So you're sitting there and they tell you all sorts of things about, you know, what cadets life is like and, you know, what's what it's like to teach them and all these different things. So there was one presentation right. that I had to sit through and it was called Cadet Sleep Cycles. Okay. And it talked right. about, you know, because these cadets, they, you know, basically high school graduates, they're young. And mm -hmm. they, um, you know, they have certain melatonin cycles and the upshot was that because of the melatonin cycles of their age group, they were not conscious, say before eight or eight 30 in the morning. Okay. And this is what we, we all sat, we had to sit through this and they told us that, be, you know, they're not conscious. I kid you not the very next semester, they decided that they were going to start classes at the air force Academy at 7.30 in the morning. So I was teaching introductory philosophy to these asleep cadets, you know, who shouldn't be awake based yeah. on their melatonin cycles at 7.30 in the morning. And of course we had the rule that if um, a cadet fell asleep in class, what you were supposed to do as a faculty member is have them stand up, you know, in the back of the classroom and everything. So I'm having to have these poor cadets who shouldn't even be awake, according to the presentation that we had to sit through, do this. They only did it for one semester and never again. So I'm totally in favor of starting it later anyway, light, not light. It's just an issue of the melatonin cycles for young kids, as far as I know. Right. Yeah, they there there have been uh, a few schools that went later, and the attendance was better, the grades were better, um, and so there's the study found that there was going to be more, um, or there was going to be more uh, college attendance, um, and so that was going to be a boom to the economy um, because you're going to essentially have better educated people sure. going into the workforce. Yeah. And so that was one reason. Uh, other reasons is uh, our people are worried about um, being out of sync with New York um, mm -hmm. with that are in banking or do trading or whatever. And so there are some people that um, don't really like the idea. And then there's just people that are like, why, why change it? We've been doing it this way since 2007, you know. Because because we just ext extended the time. Right, right. We did extend it. I think we do about a month more of daylight saving right. time than other places in the world, the, for example. Yeah. And the the funny thing is that it moved from before Halloween to after Halloween, in part because the candy lobby wanted it to be lighter um, during the Halloween uh, shopping season, so that more people will buy candy because more people want to go shopping if it's light out after work than if they're if it's dark so but anyways that's this is kind of more of a practice um thing for what i really want to do next time is is uh some a constitutional amendment and we have to get get started on that uh i think i know in which one you're talking with about your book. Right? Yeah. yeah okay okay yeah. so <laughs> So a state constitutional amendment, though, which would be very nice, maybe as a model for other places in the country well, and or the country that's, as a whole. That's possible. Yeah. And but it will also stimulate the conversation. And if it gets passed, um, then obviously there 
might be some conflict between the federal and the state constitutions, which would then bring um, it to the forefront, maybe a case to the forefront. Yeah. At, I mean, because this, uh, is, this is the thing. I mean, imagine that you achieve in your uh, really all you would need to do is say that as the state of New Hampshire, we are not applying the third party doctrine. You basically abolish the third party doctrine for New Hampshire. And then the question is, does that constitute you granting more privacy protection to your citizens, which maybe you are allowed to do in a federal system? Or are they going to say, no, you know, the state police power is supreme or something? Or, you know, is it maybe that your own state government agencies would have to follow it, but then the federal government agencies would still be able to violate New Hampshire citizens, uh, you know, privacy. Be a Supreme Court case, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, it could, I, I it thought could we be were really interesting. I thought, it, I thought it would be more along the lines of trying to protect contracts that, or like, like valid. Um, something along the lines of like valid oh so you want to um, achieve a non whole legal thing about, contract okay okay so we, we'll have to have a discussion right because yeah. in in this area of law as with every other area we've got i believe what would be called like appealing the onion problem where if you tried to do the whole reform you know tomorrow it and might the whole, get shot yeah. And, and, and there's just not, so, so let me, I know what you're talking about, but the audience doesn't know what you and I are talking about, which is that okay. my whole model for the legal protection of privacy involves protecting right. privacy on the basis of property and contract rights. And yeah. I believe that that is the right way to go. But if you tried to do that in today's legal system right now, it'd be like, you know, getting rid of all the government controls on healthcare or education, like just like that, because <laughs> what happens that like it's a bad thing. Well, okay. But if you did it right, I mean, the, there's, all of this has been there and if you, you have to kind of peel the, it's a hard to, off. it's a hard sale. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so right now, for instance, you know, as well as I do that the legal protection for property and contract rights anywhere in our country, anywhere in the world really is very deficient. And I, you know, right. part of my so-called error theory for how the right to privacy came out, came about is because these progressives, right? These pragmatists, these legal pragmatists and progressives, they were very eager to undermine property and contract rights. And one of the things that had traditionally been protected by property and contract rights was our privacy. And so they say, oh, well, we know, you know, people really care about privacy, and we want them to accept an eroding away of property and contract rights. We want the state to be able to take over property and contract a lot more. And so what, what we'll do is we'll just carve out this nice little sphere that we'll call privacy, which is all the things that, you know, people just really care about. What was it Mike Lee got criticized recently because he said, you'll be happy if you just get married and have kids or something. Don't worry about the world. Or I can't remember. It was something like that. Right. But it's like, you know, there's a lot of people who just kind of live in their little zone. And as long as government doesn't touch those little things that they call private, then they're happy. And so they, you know, the right to privacy more or less protected this sphere in a pragmatic way and then allowed for the erosion of property and contract rights. Now we have just this total erosion of property and contract rights. And if you said, you know, you only have so much privacy as you have property and contract rights, you'd be screwed. <laughs> basically. Right. What I was thinking, um, I mean, because I think that the third party doctrine do, is not really like saying that wouldn't really do anything. I was thinking something sure it more would. along sure the it lines would. Sure of it like, would. because, you know, this is the thing, right? So what they, you know, the third party doctrine, as you know, says, once you share something with a third party, then there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in it. But because there is a common law basis for drawing a distinction between a criminal context and a non-criminal context, I think what we could do is we could effectively eliminate the third party doctrine for a non-criminal context. And, so and there's, there's a basis what, in the common law the for that. Goal. 
Yeah. So we just added a constitutional amendment to privacy. So I was thinking uh, just like literally last year, um, and I was thinking of, okay, maybe we could add some phrase that says something along the lines of um, sharing information with a third party <laughs> right. does not automatically mean that you've given up your right your reasonable expectation privacy. of privacy or your yeah right or just say you're given up what i would do is maybe say it given up any expectation of privacy in it so reasonable or not because okay, yeah. well well okay okay i mean obviously if you share it you have given up an expectation of privacy with respect to whomever you are sharing it with right but right not with respect to anybody else there is no reason to think that if i share some piece of information with a doctor that therefore I expect the doctor to just turn around and share it with the government unless the government presents a warrant to him. Right. Oh, you're not going to, I mean, there's uh now there's, there's hit by now, I know. in the, well, no, there's, there's, um, there was a bill j just put into the house and g just got amended that essentially anyone that was giving information to DES, I'm on children and family. Or not, um, so DCYF, if they were giving any information to DCYF, they would be immune it, uh, immune from prosecution prosecution from criminal, um, legal, uh, criminal, civil penalties, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that I was concerned about was, as long as they did it in good faith, is that it would be eroding um, protections. I don't, I'm not sure if it would. Um, if uh, like your confidentiality with your doctor or your um, with your lawyer would be covered under that, it, or if they could still be disbarred, even though they gave information that was attorney-client privilege and was um, actually w wasn't committing a crime or anything like that, and so they weren't required to report it, but they felt like they want they could yeah. under this I new mean, rule each, each state has sort of their own variation on what the exceptions are to attorney client privilege you know when an attorney would either have an obligation or have the option to yeah. report something in order you know for instance to prevent a crime from occurring a violent crime usually right there's some sort of risk of of harm but sometimes even a risk of harm to property could be enough where you can carve out an exception it, it depends right on jurisdiction yeah i thought that it was a very uh large gaping hole that you could pretty much tell dcyf whatever you wanted as long as it was quote quote in good faith well, and um, yeah, so yeah, and then the question is, it's like all civil penalties, you know, and well, and then the, what yeah. is, good, you know, what is, what is good faith? Let's define good faith. You know, is it good right. faith? Uh, you know, you had a good breakfast and you were in a good mood that day or, you know, what is, what is good faith? So, yeah, so that was, uh, so yes, um, th that's going to be my my thing for next year, hopefully. I mean, uh, if if I have to do the Atlantic time zone, I will do it again. But, uh, well, I can't, actually, I can't do it again next year if it fails. Because oh. you you're not allowed to do the same exact thing two years in a row. You'd have to wait for a new, new biennium kind of a thing. I'd have to get elected again. Yeah, I mean, but. I liked, I liked that, you know, join the Atlantic time zone workaround because as that New York Times article that I had posted stated, people who are on the left coast like myself, we wouldn't mm -hmm. have that option. Although I guess what? We could try to join yeah. Arizona's time zone or something. That's what we'd have to that's how we'd have to do it here. Yeah. But because otherwise if unless you join an established time zone that doesn't already switch back and forth or something, it's like you have to have some, you know, so, but, sort of federal. Yeah, but you also need a reason. And so, like, we are geographically special as we are way more east than New York. And yeah. so 
you could move that line without it being like a carve out necessarily. Right. So if you did just California, it would be some weird carve out or Oregon <laughs> and Washington are not in it. And so that would just make no sense. But if you're saying, if you're arguing to the secretary of transportation, Hey, this line really should be over here because it's, it's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it would be better for, for everyone. Um, mm-hmm. then yeah, I think it will, it, it's more plausible that they will go for it because you're half, you're asking the secretary of transportation and you need to have reasons. And so it will be easier in our case. Just what would of, be the best though is if they just, just, I mean, just pass federal Let legislation and give it to us. I mean, you know, this is the thing I, I think, I think Trump tweeted about this. It, saying, he did. He yeah. Did. And he said he didn't mind if they got rid of this whole switch back and forth thing. He's fine with it. I was like, if they do this, it's like, jump on it now before he changes his mind, because this would be one just unqualifiedly, no disclaimers, good thing that Trump could do. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, um, there, so Florida has already passed legislation to, and California has passed legislation to do daylight savings time all year round, but they're not allowed to. And so Marco Rubio, I believe from Florida, um, is he's the one from Florida, right? He, I think he put, um, legislation in to allow, the states to opt in to daylight savings time all year round. But, uh, and now that the president said, Hey, yeah, I'm for this. You you would think that it would have a little bit more, um, interest and push. People would try to pass it and stuff. I just, I I get, I'm getting so cynical about, any of our Congress creatures wanting to actually do some good in the world when something like that happens and they don't just jump on it and run with it. Why not? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of States in that article. It said something like 30 States have some version of getting rid of the switch from, from summer to winter time kind of a thing. And the European union is talking about doing it It's a very popular thing nowadays. It's gaining steam. So yeah, hopefully we, just, we can we do it sooner than later. Yeah. And everybody, you know, should do what you did, which is look within your geographic area, you know, which way should you stay? Should you stay at daylight savings time or standard time throughout the year, which is the, you know, what is the best for the time zone that you're in? Obviously they can't, you know, have like tiny little geographic carve outs everywhere. Cause then we have a whole bunch of new time zones. You got to keep, I guess the time zones at least, otherwise it's just chaos, but for right. each time zone, do what you guys have done. Um, but yeah, so then basically they would just, you would just become part of the Atlantic time zone. Right. And that's also with Puerto Rico, right? Is there? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you would join them. me and your on can be on the same page. Yeah. I mean, you know, you got to hang out with the cool kids. No, he's <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's doing it. So definitely we should. That's right. No. That's right. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Good. So those, I mean, I'm always interested in trying to come up with new legislation um, um, or something that I think will actually pass. Um, one what about thing that's privatizing happening... education? What about privatizing education? Is there any I don't think it's going to pass with the Democrats in charge. No. <laughs> um, my, my, yeah, I don't think it's going to pass. They don't, they don't. So we, we were trying and got close to doing the um, uh, education savings account uh, just the last time. And I think that's a great step. And then also allowing um, uh, count, uh, town cities um, first put all of the state money in that savings account and then allow towns that maybe don't want to uh, seeing skyrocketing, skyrocketing <laughs> school costs say, hey, we're just going to like sell off our school and put the money in the savings account and you figure out, you know, what's what works for you because it is very, very expensive. Oh yeah, Um, totally. I mean, the, the cost per child is all over the country, I think skyrocketed and there's gotta be more efficient ways to do it. There's so many ways to deliver 
quality education to kids these days. And, and we need a market to try to figure out what those are. Um, so that's, that would be, I mean, obviously, yeah, if you have Democrats in charge, what you can achieve, but privacy, you're right. Privacy is one of these where maybe you and I end up having more in common with more, more Democrats than with Republicans. For example, Ted Cruz, who I liked for so long is just terrible on encryption and stuff like that. How, how are people there? Like wanting a back door? Yes. Banning encryption. I haven't, I have I have, not, I have not seen um, any legislation like trying to guarantee back doors to anything, but. Well, that would be, you I, wouldn't probably there, right? Not at the state level, at least. Yeah. Maybe it's only yeah, the, so. the federal level politicians that have such aspirations to, to you know, to grab so much control and power. Uh, I've noticed. Right, because how are you going to. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Make someone do something in another state. That's the problem. Is like they're not in our state, right? Right. If yeah. they're all in California, then how are we going to make them do something? So, I, I noticed what, the fight right now is against sales tax being oh. collected across state lines. Yeah. Yeah. How, how to how to make sure that we can try and not have sales tax <laughs> across state lines, and then and then especially for New Hampshire that doesn't have sales tax. Now we have to collect it for everyone else, but we don't have our own kind of a thing. It's very no, unfortunate. Should, yeah, you should be able to opt out of, of such then, things. And that's one of the reasons people go to New Hampshire is because exactly. you, have lo, you have low income tax or no income tax. I can't remember. We have no income tax, no sales tax, just mm -hmm. property taxes. And so the property taxes are quite And high. meals and use tax. The property taxes, yeah. Like my my grandpa has this same essentially value house in Nevada. He pays about six hundred dollars a year. I pay probably thirty uh thirty nine, maybe forty two hundred a year. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's sad. But, um yeah, lots of people upwards of nine, ten thousand dollars. I have a very cheap house, so yeah, exactly. uh, that's that's the way to keep your taxes low is buy only the house that you need. Yes. Otherwise, they will yeah charge you through the nose. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, that's I'm but but even so, like my uh, I got a very cheap house and uh, my my mortgage even with I I'm on a river so I have my uh, flood insurance and everything. It's like a thousand dollars a month, so even with the taxes and everything included, so it's oh, so not property, bad. yeah, so property costs are are pretty reasonable there, and that maybe helps make up for the fact that the tax rate is a little bit higher yeah. to make up for the other uh, lack of taxes. Okay, yeah. Was, yeah. So another thing that is popular right now is a lot of the Republicans are saying. Um, in the state house on their floor speeches that taxation is theft. And, um, and, uh, and one of the Democrats uh, wrote an op-ed or LTE uh, letter to the editor that uh, asking like, uh, wh what is this taxation is theft thing? So I'm going to have uh, an op-ed coming out in the next few days okay. about, about that. Send so it I'll, over. So I'll be on the, yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, I could send you the preview, <laughs> what I yeah. sent them, oh, but, yeah. but yeah, once it comes out, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you, let you know about that. But, um, yeah. So. Excellent. No, this, this is great. I got to have a little impromptu discussion with you. I hadn't expected to be able to interview a state legislator as part of my system check. I am quite <laughs> feeling very privileged right now, Josh, uh, especially one, I mean, you're a freshman, state legislator from New Hampshire, and you have already been mentioned in New York Times as doing something that everybody can get behind and love. So kudos. Yeah, it's fabulous. And like I Thanks. said, I feel quite fortunate. So thank you. I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to um, yep. zoom over and see. Well, actually, do you have any questions for me? Because I said this is ask me anything. And I sit here and drill you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> is it is is that what this is supposed to be? Yeah, um, it was supposed to be. 
So my my questions mostly are going to be about the book and how is it coming along? Yeah, and... it's 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 not coming like I need to. So I am um, in the process of moving. I got, you know, I had such wonderful goals when I started this new year, and then I got two hideous viruses. And then I traveled and then I decided I needed to move. And so I'm moving, but I'm not moving until after I talk to Shapiro on, uh, so are, on Monday. Have you finished then, his book? Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I'm and looking forward to talking to him. Are you going to be nice to him? On, oh yeah. Cause uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. first of all, and I don't know why I, I, and I don't know if I'm going to ask him because I don't want to use my limited time with him to ask him this question, but he follows me on Twitter. <laughs> he follows 194 people in the world on Twitter. He follows me. He's been following me for years. Why? I don't know. Um, it's cool. I'm glad he does. I mean, I, I met him. I had a conversation with him years ago, back in 2011. And I guess the conversation maybe made an impression on him, which is great. It was about law and it was actually about privacy. It was about fourth amendment stuff. It was the exclusionary rule that we talked about. And I guess that's why, because obviously he doesn't think a whole ton of objectivism per se. So it, I don't think it's because I'm an objectivist. I don't, you know, yeah. anyway, so he maybe does it was that before he knew that you were maybe, I don't know, but you know, and he, he occasionally retweets stuff and um, he's giving me his time, even though I'm smallest fry in the world. So yes, of course, I'm going to be nice to him and he's not going to give me a lot of time. So I want to use the limited time that I have to just raise yeah. a couple of things that would get him and other people thinking and have a decent conversation in the amount of time that we have. And, uh, you know, even if I had a longer time period with him, it's not like I'd say, oh, I want to debate him and wipe the floor with him and stuff. What good does that do? It's I want to have a conversation back and forth. I would like to, and I'll tell him, you know, I would like to nudge him a bit in, in terms of, you know, saying, oh, Ayn Rand's ethics are garbage. I mean, that that's just not true. And he can still say he disagrees with it at the end of the day. And of course, you know, I'm not going to convince him. I'm not going to convert him. But if I can show him some things about it that are definitely not garbage, that would be a nice goal to achieve. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, um, and that's kind of why I was asking is seeing what your, where your head is at going into the, the talk because, and, and if the goal is to, to try and get some stuff out or is it to, uh, kind of be friendly for more conversations in the future kind of a thing. So. Yeah, I mean, have a conversation, raise a couple of issues about the book that I'm thinking won't have been raised to him in exactly the same way any place else because it's from this context and, you know, an objectivist context and my particular application of objectivism in particular and just have a good conversation for the time that we have and and raised, you know, that I do hope that there's a couple things that we'll follow up on some other time. That's all. Right. And, and obviously, hopefully you can get uh, the same type of thing when when your book comes out. So yeah, I would for tack it. kind of a thing, because yeah, that would I be know. way better. No, exactly. And so, yeah, the I mean, the two things that I want to talk to him about, obviously, are privacy and objectivism. And if he had me choose one, I'd say the privacy stuff, because I think that's the one unique thing that I have to offer is that theory so um and i i think if i yeah. that's where he and i might have a lot more common ground as well right yeah yeah that's and that's it would be more interesting because you guys both have a lot of background to be discussing it yeah and he'll be familiar with a lot of the things that I'm talking about in, in that context. So it'd, it'd be fun. It would be kind of geeking out. And I've found sometimes when I talk about law with, you know, privacy law in particular with your own, that ends up not necessarily being a most popular episode, 
people just don't get how important this one arcane sounding doctrine of constitutional law is to their daily life. There is a doctrine of constitutional law that says when you share with Facebook or Twitter or your bank or anybody else that you share information with it throughout the day, suddenly you've given up all expectation of privacy in it and the government can get it without a warrant. That's what this says. And it makes a huge difference in the amount of privacy that we can enjoy. All the things that people were so upset about with the Snowden revelations, all of that is made possible in terms of its legality because of this doctrine. And yet people don't want to talk about it. You know, uh, Tucker's producer, for example, it's like, no, nah, this is too in the weeds for hmm. an audience. And I, I don't, I think it's, it's gotta not be if people are going to realize what needs to be changed in order to improve that situation and not you know, keep moving towards 1984 the way that we are. What about Josh, by the way, did you see what I posted um, that the federal government is going after Facebook on grounds of so-called housing discrimination? Uh, no, that's yeah. That they're, they're so, so the, it's the H U D I guess. Is that the acronym for the, HUD, yeah. Yeah. So they're suing Facebook for housing discrimination based on Facebook's pattern of displaying ads selectively displaying housing ads selectively. Oh, here users. it is. Yeah. I think I did see this, but I, it's just Facebook stuff. I don't care. <laughs> No, uh, yeah, that would be, that's, that's. First they came for Facebook and I didn't say anything that's... because I was not Facebook, right? <laughs> it's true. No, no, I I don't, I think it's so absurd. I think it's so absurd, but, but HUD has done stuff like that before where they're just like um, trying to find anything that could be used against, you know, a bank or whatever for loan discrimination or whatever they go super into the weeds trying to find some rationale that could make them uh like statistically not even literally just statistically showing a virus bias and then um and then charging them for discrimination because of that it's yeah, but so what I see it. this as is I see it as a Trump administration alphabet soup agency going after Facebook because Facebook is guilty of evil, quote, censorship of conservatives, right? And yeah. making them pay somehow because, you know, they can't really get them on anything unless and until those Congress creatures get together and actually pass some legislation as opposed to just hauling Zuckerberg and everybody, you know, they, they love to haul Zuckerberg before Senate and house committees or whatever, and, you know, grandstand and give all these speeches that sound so threatening. And then we haven't actually seen them do something. And now here's housing and urban development going ahead and suing Facebook on grounds that I said, you know, I said in my post, this is tantamount to, you know, it's just, it's just like going after the mafia for tax evasion, except for that Facebook is not a criminal organization as much as so many people, especially on the right these days want to say, Oh, well, Facebook, you know, they're guilty of censorship. Right. Um, and if the government gets their hooks on yeah. Facebook, we're, we're fast tracking to 1984 more than we already know yeah. <clears throat> well i mean and and Euron was right about uh it taking a lot longer for jordan peterson to get his platform up and running um than he expected because it was in december they were hoping like weeks like by the end of the year and then it's about it's about to be april and still no word on that yeah. so yeah, but and, and the Patreon thing is is an issue. Uh, did you hear about the any of these platforms? But you the can't rely but on. Apple the the Apple uh, new credit card seems interesting. Where they well, are supposedly the Apple isn't going to know where you're buying the stuff. Hmm. Um, they're trying to keep that secret. Um, 
and they're the credit card something. doesn't have any credit awesome. card interest. They're, do- yeah, they're doing, they're doing something awesome. What they're doing is they're trying to set up all their various systems, right? And I also was listening to part of the presentation on the Apple News Plus. You know, the you could pay for the news service and get all the magazines and you get, I guess, the Wall Street Journal and the LA okay. Times, right? All this stuff, if you pay $9.99 a month, you can read just tons of good stuff. And... You know, technically, I don't get how it would work very well. It sounds a little bit clunky to me, but they're saying they're saying that we at Apple don't even know what you read. And the reason we don't know what you read is the decisions to curate for you and any of the information about what you end up reading of the curated stuff is made at the device level. So somehow, you know, all this content, comes down, you know, into my device. And then the device gives me a display, some kind of a feed based on, you know, what it thinks. And then Mm -hmm. I guess within that feed, at least the information about what I end up actually reading only stays in the device. The reason it sounds a little far-fetched to me is I'm thinking they'd have to download the entire article for like all these articles. It sounds very memory intensive in order to achieve that level of privacy where only the device knows, you know, basically what you've done. And of course we encrypt our device. They do like tags on it or something. Like you're just getting the tags until you actually look at the article and then you download the whole article. Well, right. They could just tag. There'd There'd be information about what you downloaded that at least Apple would have then. Right. Maybe oh, it doesn't yeah, retain it, you know, so, but, but there, you can see where the third party doctrine is making them come up with all of these workarounds in order to protect your privacy because right. their whole focus is, you know, like you say with these, I haven't looked at the credit card transaction stuff. That sounds interesting, but their whole focus is on you sharing as little information as possible with Apple the third party and keeping, keeping all of the information in an encrypted, you know, password encrypted protected device. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, but you know, why it's only necessary because of this third party doctrine (laughs) that they're having to jump through all these hoops. Otherwise you should be, you know, all all you people is like, you think, Oh, this is arcane. This is boring. I want to hear about this doctrine, Amy. Apple is jumping through all of these hoops because of this silly doctrine. If we had just, you know, protection of contract rights with respect to privacy at that level, which we could have if we, you know, carved out the sort of common law contours of the doctrine properly, that's it. And so, like I said, you know, if we talk about privacy, Josh, and where could you sort of start to peel the layer off the onion, there is a way to do that consistent with a common law, you know, sort of rationale that doesn't require, you know, considering legal protection for privacy all across the board as based on property and contract, we can have that sort of, I think we can have that one insertion point and do a lot of good. And then also maybe get people thinking about the broader reforms for the long term. That's my hope anyway. So we should, I definitely want to talk with you about this. It's exciting to even think of being able to achieve something. And like you said, when you got Democrats, you can go across the aisle with Democrats on privacy. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. But it, who's in charge? Definitely. Like I probably wouldn't have done the, I probably wouldn't have been doing the education stuff if the Republicans are in charge, but the daylight savings time crosses, crosses, uh, political divides and hopefully privacy. I mean, it, it got, it, it got a super majority. It had, so to amend our constitution, you have to do a super majority in both houses and by the people Wow. in a vote. And so we just it amended it literally last year. But that language but, was pretty and, vague, right? So yeah. 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 So we got to, we got to tighten it up, but yeah. it will, I think it's still the same like goal. And so it shouldn't be any, uh, hopefully it's not that much harder, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you, 
Josh, I guess I should go. Absolutely. I, can't, I can't believe how long I've stayed on, but it's because you make it so interesting to talk to you. So um, I wish you the best and yeah, keep in touch and send me your article. Uh, probably the published version better. And then I'll just send it out to the world. Yeah. Okay? Yep. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Talk to you. Oh, I muted him too soon. Sorry, Josh. Uh, so I'm over here on YouTube and I'm going to look at any of the comments. Yeah. One person had commented that it's showing the, the phone number. Some of it is starred out or whatever. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to have a workaround for that when uh, Ben Shapiro calls. Nonetheless, it doesn't still show the whole phone number. So it's not like you're going to get his phone number. And it does give an indication that either he's talking or I'm talking. It's not the worst thing in the world. The quality of that was really nice, I thought. So I'm happy about the quality. And all I need to do is reboot the system. So I'm sorry, those of you who were um, on, on the earlier broadcast when I had all of those glitches. Obviously, it's just to reboot the system. So I'm going to reboot the entire system early Monday morning, make sure that we are completely up to speed and ready for this when I've got Ben Shapiro on Monday. Um, I'm going to be starting again. I was telling people I'm going to start broadcasting noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And then he's going to call in during that hour and talk to him for a bit and see how it goes. Uh, Dakota over here on the YouTube chat is asking, wouldn't we have to write new use agreement contracts in order to protect privacy in a common law matter? Is it a tort issue? Okay, so there's two things, right? I mean, you could have a tortious interference with a contract, but the question is, are you even allowed to write a contract that protects privacy these days as it stands right now, no matter what the contract between Facebook and I says, the third party doctrine says that the government doesn't need a warrant to get any of the information that I share with Facebook. And the only protection that we have for that data that we share with Facebook or any of these other third parties, the only protection that we have is the protection that our Congress creatures, the legislators deign to give to us. And, you know, one of the things that has disappointed me so much in the post Snowden revelation era is Snowden himself fawning over every little bit of legislation where they sort of tweak things and, oh, the NSA promises to do things better and this slight reform here and that there. None of this means anything because all of it, it's just legislation. It can be amended, repealed, changed, whatever in the next Congress. What we need is we need a reform at the constitutional level, which Josh is smart enough to be going after in New Hampshire. But at a federal level, we either need a Supreme Court opinion that drastically cuts into or eliminates the third party doctrine, or we'll need some legislation that is actually doing it. But I'd rather see a constitutional amendment where they bring information shared with a third party in a non-criminal context, right? Just you and me being on Facebook or doing business with the phone company or, you know, whatever, just normal going about our lives transactions. Those would be protected by fourth amendment. The government would have to present probable, you know, warrant based on probable cause, particular suspicion in order to get that information as long as you have a contractual relationship with the person that you're sharing the information with, which we all do, right? Um, that's what needs to be done. And that's not what has been done. So, um, yeah, so there, I don't know if you have to write a new contract. I mean, you could write a contract and actually expect it to be enforced if we change the law in the, in the proper way right now, you know, Facebook will just probably have in its user agreement with you. It'll say something like, we don't share your information unless required by law, except for blah, 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 right? Um, or you give us permission, you give us explicit permission. We don't share it unless required by law, but unless required by law is they give process. The good thing is that a number of these service providers, Apple and Facebook and Google and Twitter and them, they have often been good at challenging requests from the government for information. So maybe they're not being so strict about it to the extent that it would be a, a warrant requirement, you know, tantamount to a warrant requirement. Maybe they're not 
that strict about it, but, um, they are not necessarily giving in each time there's a court order presented to them. And a lot of them have been very transparent as well about how many requests and our court orders or, you know, whatever there's all the, in different realms and under different pieces of legislation, there's all these different, you know, sort of amounts of suspicion and probably is it, it's less than probable cause and it's not particular suspicion. You know, what is it that's required for a subpoena or a court order or a warrant right now? We know warrants have to be probable cause and particular suspicion, but subpoenas and court orders, there's something less than that. And, um, you know, companies like Apple and Facebook and Google, and some, they will sometimes give you statistics. They'll say in the last year, the government has given us X, Y, Z number of requests and we have complied with X percentage of them and not, you know, with these other, they are pushing back. The companies are pushing back and Apple, um, one thing I didn't get to mention to Josh and I was sitting there interrupting him because I kept thinking of it was very recently on Twitter uh, in the time upcoming, you know, leading up to this recent event that they just did the other day on Twitter, they were putting ads out talking about privacy, how, the, you know, their focus on privacy, that they want to really give you, you know, privacy in these devices. And Josh and I, in our conversation, did talk about a couple of features that are geared towards, you know, continuing to give you privacy. As I said, these, all these features, the hoops that they're having to jump through seem to be wholly because of the existence of this doctrine that needs to be abolished. So yes, I got to get this book out there um, after get my move done first. So Shapiro interview Monday, move after that and then focus. And um, you'll be seeing more of me here on YouTube, but probably only once a week because I don't want to get myself so distracted that I'm not going to get that done and do the, you know, the piece of good that I think I have to do in the world. So uh, anything else? I got that question from Dakota. I don't see anything else. I'll look on my Facebook thread to see if somebody put a question there. And if not, I'm going to go ahead and sign off because I've been on for so long now. This is way longer than I had intended to, to be on. Let me see. That's something different. Something about pineapple pizza, no doubt. <laughs> Keeps coming up. Yeah, they were saying breaking up very no, no, now the sound is good on this. I assume the sound has been good on this broadcast the entire time. Yes, people? All good? I'll wait for anybody to write a comment. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in impromptu and for your patience with the glitches on the first go around. And I'm signing off now. I will see you bright and early, at least bright and early West Coast time on Monday. I'm going to look half asleep or something. I'm sorry about that. But what do you care? You get to listen to Ben Shapiro. So thank you. I'll talk to you guys Monday.